And now, stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, transcribed for Christmas by the Signal Oil Company to enable the cast and the entire production staff of The Whistler to enjoy Christmas Day at home with their families. S-I-G-N-A-L Signal Signal Gasoline Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, the Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Letter from Cynthia. <laughs> To the holiday staff on duty at the small hospital on the outskirts of a small town on the coast of Southern California. Christmas night was much like any other night. Not quite, of course, for the spirit of the season was in the air. A tree austerely but beautifully decorated in a motif of silver and white stood majestically alone in the center of the reception lobby. The attractive receptionist at the desk, who doubled on the switchboard at night, glanced eagerly at a dozen festively wrapped packages and presents left for her earlier in the day by various members of the staff. From the church across the street, the soft melody of a Christmas carol floated through the open window on the far side. The sound of footsteps descending the stairs on the right caused the girl to glance up as one of the newer doctors who was serving his internship strolled casually to the desk. Thought I'd come down for a little breather. Kind of slow tonight, Patty. Is that bad for Christmas night? What do you want from Santa Claus anyway, Dr. Andrews? A a couple of emergency appendectomies? (laughs) No, I didn't mean that. I just meant it's kind of... Oh, sure, I know. And it suits me fine. I got two hours sleep today and eight hours in front of me here at this desk. Oh, that's bad, Pat. You'll never see your grandchildren if you keep that up. Mm, People were dropping in all day long. You know how it is Christmas Day. Mm. Good night, Patty. Hope you had a nice Christmas. Oh, I did, Dr. Peters. Thanks for the nice present. You're welcome. Good night, Doc. Good night, Neil. Yeah, Patty, it's like I said. A gal like you needs eight hours sleep a day. Did you get eight hours sleep today, Doctor? Ten. <laughs> you would. You know, you're an odd man, Dr. P- Andrews. Odd? Well, how do you mean? I mean, I don't know. You act like there's something bothering you. Like there's something on your mind all the time. Well, maybe there is. Well... Everybody has things on their mind. You could still go out and dance, have fun, like the other doctors do. The single ones, I mean. Too busy. I'm still an intern, you know. Make it sound like a sentence. (laughs) Yes? Outside line? Yes, sir. Oh, here, doctor, I almost forgot. Hmm? Maybe this pretty pink envelope will change your viewpoint. Hmm, a letter. When did this come? I don't know. I just came on duty ten minutes ago. Why don't you open it? What? Dr. Andrews, your hands are trembling. I believe your viewpoint's changed already. Yes, Neil, your hands are trembling as you recognize the handwriting. Read the return address on the envelope. The address of lovely Cynthia Walker. She's out of your life now, isn't she, Neil? 
No. She'll never be out of your life, will she? You're just out of hers. You walk across the lobby, choose a chair near a light, and stare into space for a moment. The memory of that last moment with Cynthia crowding every other thought from your mind. It isn't pleasant to recall, is it, Neil? The unfortunate accident that cost you your reputation, your position, and the love of Cynthia Walker. At the very beginning of your career as an intern in an important hospital. You remember Cynthia's thoughtless, angry words that followed. Yes, looking back to that day more than a year ago, it's hard to believe now that a few hours could have made so much difference in your future. But they did. And as you try to read the words on the scrap of paper, Cynthia's letter in your hand, you know that one man is responsible for it all. Charles Arthur Bennett, the man who lied when the truth would have cleared you. Charles Arthur Bennett, the man who called himself your best friend. The sound of an ambulance wheeling into the receiving room below shatters your train of thought. Across the room, a yellow light flashes on the switchboard. You turn quickly back to the letter. But your thoughts are blurred, and you know you won't have time to finish your letter before you get the call you're sure is coming. Yes, Doctor. Yes, Doctor? Yes. I'll make out the registration card right away. Dr. Andrews? Yes? Yes, Pat? Admitting room? No, Miss Stevens is busy. 412 has had a relapse. Oh. They're taking the emergency to the third floor. Dr. Graham wants you to go to the third floor drug room. What kind of accident? Car crash, traumatic and hemotractic shock. Uh-huh. Patient very weak. Dr. Graham wants you to prepare injections of sereptamine and sacralin. Take them to the operating room, third floor. Right. I was afraid we might have one of these before the day was over. You get any details? No, only it was an automobile accident. The man's unconscious. But according to the identification card in his wallet, his name is Charles Bennett, salesman. Who did you say? Bennett. Charles Arthur Bennett, Los Angeles. Because this is Christmas Day, Signal Oil Company has asked me to skip the regular message about Signal Gasoline so that we can enjoy a few extra chuckles over Christmas limericks sent in by you Whistler fans. Tonight's first $20 Signal Gasoline book goes to Mrs. E. Morrow of La Jolla, California for this limerick. Said Santa when boarding his sled, This year I'm using my head. It's signal for me. I'll go farther. You'll see. And over the rooftops he sped. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with go farther gasoline. Tonight's second $20 signal gasoline book goes to Victor Ehrman of Long Beach, California for this limerick. A child asked his father one day how St. Nick went so far on his sleigh. The wise father replied, he can take that long ride because his reindeer drinks signal, they say. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far, but go for the gasoline. (laughs) Our only regret is that Signal could not have added a $20 coupon book to every Whistler fan's Christmas stocking. But we do hope that yours was filled with all the good things you wanted and more. Yes, Neil, it's a shock, isn't it, to realize what's happened. For more than a year, your resentment of Charlie Bennett has smoldered. And now the girl at the switchboard tells you that he's here in the hospital where you're now interning, the victim of an automobile accident, that you have to prepare the drugs that might save his life. Might save his life. As you hurry up the stairs along the hallway to the laboratory, your thoughts go back to that night more than a year ago. The circumstances were quite different then, weren't they, Neil? 
Because although you didn't then realize it, that night you were at the mercy of Charlie Bennett. The night which began at a birthday party for Charlie Bennett more than a year ago at the home of a mutual friend. But as far as you were concerned, there were just the three of you. Cynthia, Charlie, your best friend, and you. Yes, Neil, things were much different then. Oh, it's a wonderful party. I wish I didn't have to leave right in the middle of it. Well, if you must, you must. I'll drive you home. No, darling, I've already phoned for a taxi. Now, this is the first time you've been off duty from the hospital in a long time. I want you to stay here and relax and have fun. Okay, but I might get into trouble, you know. <laughs> I trust you. You're a big boy now. Or I wouldn't have told you I'd marry you. Have you told Charlie? No. No, not yet. I... I'll tell him tomorrow. I don't want to seem conceited, but... Well, telling him tonight that I'm going to marry you, it... It just might spoil his birthday party. Yes, it would. By the way, where is Charlie? Oh, he's around. Over in the corner, I think. That island completely surrounded by the ocean of blondes. Well, I wouldn't think of invading that territory. <laughs> just to tell him good night. You tell him for me, will you, Neil? Sure. You really have to go. Oh, I'm afraid so. Jane's only in town for the night, and I don't get to see my sister very often. My taxi ought to be here by now. Now, it's your night off, dear. You have fun. You interns don't get out of that hospital often enough. And besides, the champagne is wonderful. Anything you say, darling. <laughs> Reluctantly, you see Cynthia to a cab and come back to the birthday party for Charlie. You take Cynthia's advice, too. Enjoy a little champagne. Make party talk with other friends, and you do have a good time, Neil. You relax for the first time in weeks. In another hour or two, most of the crowd is gone, and finally, you even convince Charlie that it's time to go home. And in the lobby, going out. Why don't you leave your car here, Charlie, and go home in style, like I am? What do you mean, in style? Leave your car here. Get a taxi. Hey, what's the idea? I can drive. <laughs> oh, don't tell me the good doctor's in his cups from a little champagne. <laughs> oh, no, no, not really, but I just don't want to do any driving, that's all. Well, you don't have to do any. A little bit of champagne didn't bother me. <laughs> Look, tell you what, hmm? we live close to each other. We'll use your car and... Yeah, I'll pick mine up tomorrow. I'd sure rather take a taxi. Oh, aren't any taxis around anyway? There's a stand about three blocks away. Not at night, Neil. Oh, besides, you'll need your car to get to the hospital in the morning. Come on, Neil, boy. <laughs> I'm okay. Uh, all right, if you're sure. Let's go. But take it easy now. <laughs> Once in the car, you make one more effort to talk Charlie out of driving, but to no avail. You're getting a little weary of the slight argument, so you let him drive your car. And after the first few blocks, you decide you have nothing to worry about. Charlie seems to be driving satisfactorily. Slightly over the speed limit, but everything seems to be all right until he suddenly turns a corner sharply. That's the last you remember for a little while. When you open your eyes, you feel a dizziness, a dull pain at your temple, and someone's talking somewhere. Come on, fella. That's it. Come on, boy. Come on. Here. Are you hurt? Hurt? Oh, no. I, uh, no, officer. I, uh... All right, not much, I guess. Just a bump on the head. Uh, hey, that lamppost made quite an impression on your car, though. What's the idea of driving like that? Oh, uh, me? Charlie was driving. Oh, Charlie was driving. Yeah, he's... He's gone? He sure is absent. Say, you're a little on the woozy side, friend. Well, Charlie, where, where's Charlie? Hey, come on, chum. That's enough about Charlie. Now, how much have you had to drink, anyway? I haven't had much to drink. Look here, officer. Charlie was here. I know he was here. No one was here, chum. I heard the crash around the corner and came straight here. No Charlie, no nobody. Just you and the little man who wasn't here. But he couldn't have gone. Charlie! Yeah, that's all, chum. We got a swell place downtown where you can uh, sleep on it, huh? <laughs> It's like a nightmare, isn't it, Neil? You're bewildered and confused by what's happened. It's all a mistake, isn't it? A horrible mistake. And Charlie will show up soon and explain everything. 
Then you're booked at police headquarters and spend the rest of the night pacing back and forth in jail. Finally, in the early morning, someone is there to put up your bail. <laughs> Hello, Cynthia. Hello, Neil. I, I came as quickly as I could. Thanks. Thanks for uh, springing me. Come along, Neil. I'll drive you home. How did you find out I was here? Well, the whole story is in the morning papers. And it mentions your connection with the hospital, too. Well, I suppose so. Dr. Rogers called me about it. He, he was quite concerned. Well, he needn't have been. We'll get this whole thing cleared up in no time. No time at all. Oh, I, I hope so, Neil. Sure. As soon as I see Charlie Bennett. Charlie? Yeah, he'll tell him what really happened. He was driving the car. It was all his fault. I was just... What's the matter, Cynthia? Why are you looking at me like that? Well, I, I've already talked with Charlie. Well, he told you then how it really happened. Charlie said he wasn't with you last night when it happened. He took a cab. He went home alone. It leaves you stunned, doesn't it, Neil? You're certain there must be some mistake. But once Charlie understands how much it means to you, he'll realize what's happened and tell the truth. It's too late to prevent the unfavorable publicity for the hospital. But at least you could be cleared in Dr. Rogers' eyes and in Cynthia's. You see Cynthia safely home and then take a taxi directly to Charlie's apartment. He isn't there. But the desk clerk lets you in and you settle down to wait and to think. Nearly two hours later, a key sounds in the door. Neil. Hiya, pal. Why didn't you tell me you were coming? I would have waited. I didn't plan on it. The desk clerk let me in. You talked to Cynthia on the phone this morning, didn't you, Charlie? Cynthia? Yeah, crack of dawn, naturally. She was worried about you. Naturally. And what did you tell her? Oh, that's what's worrying you, huh? Well, I didn't really mean to do it, Neil, but I had to. Uh, want a drink? No. Mind if I have one? Look, Charlie, I'm trying to give you a chance to explain. Okay, okay. No reason to get sore. You lied to Cynthia. Why? Well, I told you I had to. You know, as a salesman, I have to drive a car to make a living, What's Neil? that got to do with it? Only everything, that's all. Look, Neil, I didn't bother to mention it to anyone, but I was in a scrape three weeks ago. I got hauled up for driving under the weather. I got off with a fine and a warning that time. Wait but... a minute. You mean you deliberately let me take the rap for your accident last night? Well, I tell you, I couldn't help it. Do you know what a spot this has put me in? The hospital has a reputation they're pretty jealous of, you know. Sure, and I've got a job. And so have I. I think you'd better put down that drink and get your coat on, Charlie. Why? Because you're coming with me to explain to Dr. Rogers. Then we're going together to see Cynthia. Oh, what good would that do? It's all over now, Neil. You mean you're refusing? I mean I went home in a taxi last night alone. Told my story once and I don't see anything to gain by changing it now. <laughs> Suddenly it occurs to you that Charlie has a more important reason for lying. His job is only part of it. He's always wanted to marry Cynthia too, despite your long friendship. He believes that anything's fair in love or war. It's as simple as that. And with you out of the way, he's sure he'll have a clear field. And Cynthia, after all this, what about Cynthia, Neil? You have to be sure. Can you be sure of Cynthia now? Neil, I... I just can't understand it. You don't believe me, do you? But you do believe Charlie. Why would he lie about a thing like this? Because with me out of the way, he thinks he could marry you. Neil, I've known Charlie for years. He wouldn't do a thing like that. Besides, he's your best friend. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's proved that, hasn't he? Neil, aren't you forgetting that Charlie wasn't found in the wreck? That you were? You all alone? Your story is... Well, it's too fantastic. The police don't believe it. And Charlie says it couldn't have been that way. And you, Cynthia. What do you say? Oh, Neil, what can I say? Do you think I want to believe this? And Dr. Rogers, the hospital. What do they say? Naturally, I resigned. I couldn't do anything else. I don't blame them for what they think, any of them. But I know I'm right, and... Never mind, Cynthia. I guess there's no use in going over all that again. Neil, you're not going. Well, why not? I don't seem to be getting anywhere. What's going to happen, Neil? Will you... Well, do you think you'll be able to get an internship somewhere else? 
I think so. I'm just as qualified as I ever was. My previous record was good, and I've learned a lot. Sorry this has been too much for you, Cynthia. I haven't you said You wouldn't that... consider marrying a man you didn't believe, would you? I want to believe you, Neil, more than I ever wanted to believe anything. Well, maybe you will someday. Maybe you'll learn the truth. When you do, let me know. You'll be able to find me. Yes, it all happened more than a year ago, didn't it, Neil? You cut off all contacts with your friends in Los Angeles. You've often wondered if Cynthia ever married Charlie. And every time you've wondered, your hatred toward him has grown deeper. You've often thought of killing him, haven't you? Yes, often. And now on Christmas night, more than a year later, in a small, out-of-the-way hospital, fate places the life of Charlie Bennett squarely in your hand. The switchboard operator has told you that he's in the operating room unconscious, seriously injured in an auto accident. And you've been assigned to prepare the medication which will spell life or death for him. Just a little too much, or not quite enough. It's almost too easy, isn't it? Not the slightest suspicion will be attached to you. You smile as you enter the drug room and find another intern there. What's the emergency, Neil? Car wreck. You assisting? No, just preparing the sereptamine and sacrament shots. Well, it must have been a pretty bad accident. I'm yeah, afraid so. You ever stop to think about the power of these drugs? Just the right amount means almost certain recovery. And too much or too little, oblivion. Do you always get this philosophical at Christmas? No, no, but I guess this case made me think about it more than usual. You see, uh, I know the guy. Oh, a friend? You said it. What a friend. Oh, kind of an unusual situation, isn't it? A very unusual situation. You know, friends, we of Signal Oil Organization feel mighty proud and pleased that you have invited the Whistler into your home so regularly throughout the year and especially on Christmas Day. For all of us of the cast, I want to express our own sincere appreciation, too. During the seven consecutive years that the Whistler has been broadcast by Signal Oil Company, many of us have had the pleasure of celebrating Christmas with many of you a number of times. And believe me, we feel it a real honor that you consider us a part of your entertainment family. Tonight, on behalf of Signal Oil Company and the independent signal dealers who serve you, in the states of California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, and Arizona. I want to say, we hope that your Christmas has been a merry one. May your new year be filled with peace, prosperity, and the good health with which to enjoy the many blessings of living in the good old USA. Well, Neil, the die is cast, isn't it? You've donned your sterile mask and gown and prepared the injection, carried them to the operating room where you placed them on the instrument tray without even a glance at the mask she covered patient. You note Dr. Graham's nod of dismissal and quietly leave the operating room where Charlie Bennett's chance for life or death lies squarely in your hands. You never dreamed you'd have such an opportunity, did you, Neil? After removing your mask and gown, you return to the hallway Wait by a window near the operating room as the melody from the church again drifts in through the window. You wonder whether you're glad or sorry at what you've done. Then you remember the disgrace Charlie Bennett brought on you, your shattered hopes, the happiness you might have had with Cynthia. And you know the answer. Even if you could, you wouldn't change the situation in the slightest. You pause under a ceiling light and decide to finish Cynthia's letter. And now, as another Christmas approaches... I realize how hasty I seemed in my judgment. Suddenly your heart beats faster. As you realize she's still Miss Cynthia Walker, you can almost hear the words as the melody of her voice haunts your memory. But you were even more hasty in your action. Your sudden, abrupt leaving. Not letting me know where you were. 
I know now how wrong I was to doubt you. But even when my doubts were deepest, I loved you. You told me once a woman loves in spite of a man's weakness, not because of his strength. Remember, Neil? Well, so it was and is with me and you. I haven't changed, and I can't believe that you have. Merry Christmas, Cynthia. You turn away, stare out the window. Suddenly you're horrified and ashamed that you, a doctor, bound by the sacred oath of Hippocrates, have allowed your hatred for Charlie Bennett to bring you to the point that it did. Finally, the door to the operating room opens. The still form is wheeled silently past you. You continue to stare out the window. You light a cigarette and wait for Dr. Graham to emerge from the operating room. As he opens the operating room door and enters the hallway, you walk slowly toward him. How's the patient, Doctor? Well, the patient's going to be all right. I'm glad you were around. Sereptamine's a godsend. Uh, may I uh, have a cigarette, Andrews? Oh, sure, Doctor. Oh, thank you. I wish Sereptamine had been available when I first started practice. <laughs> Matter of fact, I wish I were young like you, just beginning. Oh, you'll be a great doctor one day, Andrews. Will I? I'm sure of it. You're honest. Duty comes first with you. Why, you could no more evade it than commit murder. No, I guess I couldn't. But I almost made a terrible mistake a little while ago. A mistake that could have been fatal to your patient. Mm, but you didn't. No. No, and I don't think I'll ever be tempted to make a similar mistake again. I'm sure you won't, whatever it was. No, the practice of medicine's in your heart, above everything. Yes, I guess it is. Oh, it is. I've always known that. That's why I appointed you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, when can I speak with Mr. Bennett? Oh, any time you wish. He's lying down in my office. Bennett wasn't seriously injured, just uh, knocked out temporarily. He was driving the car. You mean someone else was... Oh, our patient was the young lady with him. It seems they were on the way out here to the hospital to see one of our interns. She'll be okay. Doctor, who was she? Well, her name's, uh, uh, Walker. Uh, Cynthia Walker. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine automotive accessories. Remember, if you would like the fun of having your friends hear a limerick of yours on the Whistler, the address to which to send it is the Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles 55, California. All limericks become the property of the Signal Oil Company. Those selected for use on the Whistler will be chosen by our advertising representatives on the basis of humor, suitability, and originality. So, of course, they must be your own composition. Featured in tonight's transcribed story were David Ellis, Isabel Jewell, and Paul Fries. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Edward Bloodworth, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program. And signal gasoline is tops, too, tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And signal is the famous go-farther gasoline, available wherever you see the signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies independent signal dealers from Canada to Mexico. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Letter from Yesterday. Sitting by the window of the streamliner as it sped through the night toward Los Angeles, Arthur Wilson seemed like any average, middle-aged businessman. But there had been a time when Arthur Wilson was something else, somebody else, Jack Foley. And though it had been 25 years ago, Jack Foley, now Arthur Wilson, would never forget it. The plaintive wail of the train whistle drifting back at him now somehow recalled that other time and place, exactly as if it were now, this moment. Perhaps it was because another whistle had marked the time when it all began. The night that Jack Foley was given a chance to reach out, to grasp a new life. That night, 25 years ago, in a prison machine shop. That's all, you guys. Clean up the shop. Right. Well, Dave, that about does it. This truck's practically got a new motor in it. Yeah, she's in fine shape, Foley. Come on, let's get this stuff cleaned up Foley. and put away. Yeah? The ignition keys. Hand them over. What? Look, I don't want any trouble. Give me the keys. I'm getting out of here. Prison break? Oh, now, wait a minute, Shut Dave. up. It's all set. Evans and Harris are by the delivery gate. I'm picking them up with this truck, and we're getting out. You want to come along? Hey, what's holding it up back there? Make up your mind, Foley, fast. The guard will be coming back here, and i got to take care of him. Well, what do you say? It happens suddenly, doesn't it? A chance for freedom thrust into your hands. You have three more years to serve on your sentence for manslaughter. A sentence that was the result of a moment of blind, unreasoning anger. You still feel it was unjust, don't you? That the judge's decision was too harsh. And now, in an instant, it's up to you to make your own decision. Come on, Foley. You're coming along, or ain't you? The guard's on his way back here now. All right. I'm with you. Let's go. Dave, the guard back there. You should have gone easier with him. Maybe I should have let you do it and killed the guy, huh? You sure this is going to work? Stop worrying, will you? I told you I took care of everything. Look up ahead. It's Evans and Harris waiting. And there's the gate guard out cold. You better slow down, Dave. The alarm. They'll never get us now. Swing on, you guys. We ain't stopping. There's a one-way ride and none at all. Yes, you're on a train now. It was a very different ride you took that night. But when it was over, you were a free man. And Jack Foley, convict, became Arthur Wilson, hardware clerk of Medford, later Arthur Wilson, proprietor. You were never recognized or challenged. And now, many years later, you're able to journey toward Los Angeles to attend the wedding of your daughter, Sally. The trip is uneventful, calm. The hour before the storm. But you have no way of knowing that. And on an evening a week later, you're thinking only of Sally as you dance with her at the home of Mrs. Alice Terhune Franklin, mother of her fiancé, Stephen Franklin. Oh, Dad, isn't it wonderful? I'm so happy. I know you are. You show it. I guess I do. The best part of the whole thing is you're here. You think I'd miss it, dear? My only daughter. 
to think in four more days you'll be married. I wish Mother could have been here. Yes. So do I. Do you like Stephen? Of course. He's a great kid. Your future mother-in-law seems very nice, too. Mrs. Franklin? Oh, she's swell, Dad. Come on, let's go join Stephen. He's in the library. <laughs> you can't leave that man of yours for five minutes, eh? Well, I'll leave him later for a dance with you. All right, dear. Sally. Thought I'd lost you. Just bringing her back to you, Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Enjoying yourself, sir? Yes, I'm doing fine. I'll bet you do a lot better with a little refreshment. Oh, Jameson. Yes, sir? What'll it be, Mr. Wilson? Creme de menthe? A stinger? Well, what about you, Mother? A stinger sounds exciting, but just a small one, Jameson. And please have Hilda serve the sandwiches. Yes, ma'am. And uh, you, sir? Oh, a stinger will be fine for me, too. Bring them out on the terrace, Jameson. I want Mr. Wilson to see the way we've lighted the garden. Oh, now be careful of Mother, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> a dangerous woman? <laughs> Very. <laughs> now you two run along and dance. Sally, take him away. Mm, I'd love to. <laughs> that son of mine. He... He's a fine boy. Yes, he is. Uh, here, we can go this way. Oh, thank you. Say... This is nice. Yes. And it was a good excuse. I wanted to talk to you, Mr. Wilson, alone. Oh? Um, this is rather difficult for me to talk about, Mr. Wilson. But, well, quite frankly, I'm concerned. Uh, now, I don't want you to think it's because we don't all love Sally. We do. But, um... But what, Mrs. Franklin? Well, uh, you run a hardware store, Mr. Wilson... In Medford. Anything wrong with that? Oh, no, no, not at all. I'm sure that it's a very fine store. But, um, but before that, who were you? What did you do? Who, who was I? Well, what I mean is, we know so little about you. Sally herself doesn't even seem sure. I only wondered if you... It's quite natural that you'd wonder, Mrs. Franklin, but I can set your mind at ease. I was brought up by an uncle. Ran away like so many youngsters did in those days. Went to sea for a while. Oh, and your uncle, uh, where is he now? He's dead. He was my mother's brother. As for my father, well, I scarcely remember him, but... Mr. Wilson, I don't mean to recall unhappy moments to you. I know you must think I'm terrible, but... But you see, my son... I think I understand. I feel the same way about my daughter, Mrs. Franklin. I'm proud that she's marrying Stephen. Thank you. And I'm sure you can see that I would at least inquire so that the children shouldn't make a mistake that they might regret. Oh, there'll be no regrets, Mrs. Franklin. No reason that there should be. Believe me. Mm, very well, Mr. Wilson. We won't discuss it any further. And thank you. After all, the important thing is that Stephen is going to marry a fine girl. I'm glad you feel that way about Sally. Oh, I do, and... And now, if you don't mind, I'll just go back in. Stephen knows that I've been worried, and I want to tell him that everything is all right. Well, uh, thank you. Mind if I stay out here a few minutes? Oh, yes, do, by all means. It's so nice and quiet that uh, it gives a person a chance to think. Yes. Oh, and uh, here's Jameson. You can serve Mr. Wilson here, Jameson. Yes, ma'am. I'm just going back inside. I'll take mine. Thank you. I'll be along shortly, Mrs. Franklin. All right. Your drink, sir? Oh, yes. Thanks. Thinking of something else? <laughs> yes, I was. But it doesn't matter. I think it would, sir. To her. What are you talking about? Delightful woman, Mrs. Franklin. Pleasant. Friendly. But very, very devoted to that son of hers. All she has in the world, you know. Aren't you being a little presumptuous, Jameson? Presumptuous? Oh, no, sir. Not at all. I wouldn't dare be presumptuous to one of Mrs. Franklin's guests. She could cause a lot of trouble, you know, to anyone who wasn't right in line. You're a little confusing, Jameson. I don't suppose you've been sampling these stingers? No, sir. I never drink when I've got business on my mind. 
But I don't want to be confusing. I want to be perfectly clear. She was asking questions, wasn't she? Wanted to know all about you. Now, see here, Jameson. I'm talking, sir. And you'd better listen quite carefully if you know what's good for you. Because I could break up your daughter's marriage in a minute. Mr. Jack Foley. Jack Foley? Yes, sir. We know the gentleman, don't we? Now, shall we talk about him? Or do you think Jack Foley'd prefer to go back behind those prison bars? With the prologue of Letter from Yesterday, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. Now, here's good news for you drivers who will be needing a new battery this winter. Did you know that there's now a new, finer battery which lasts up to two and a half times as long as ordinary batteries? I'm referring to the new Signal Deluxe battery, which is guaranteed for a full two and a half years on a service basis. The secret of this amazingly long life in Signal Deluxe batteries is their improved design all-rubber separators, the finest type known to battery engineering. But longer life is only part of the story. In addition, Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power and require water far less frequently. So much for their quality. But how about price? Well, considered on a per-month basis, which is really the only way to figure battery costs, Signal Deluxe batteries actually cost less than many ordinary batteries. No wonder drivers with an eye to economy, as well as those who demand tops in performance, are both heading to Signal service stations for a Signal Deluxe battery, the new, finer battery, backed by a full 30-month guarantee. And now back to the whistler. It was a sudden thing again, wasn't it, Arthur? Like the moment of anger that resulted in your sentence for manslaughter more than a quarter of a century ago when you were still Jack Foley. The sudden decision you made a few years later to join in that prison break. And now this startling recognition by a servant in the home of your daughter's fiancé who calls himself Jameson. He can destroy everything, can't he? Your daughter Sally's coming marriage, your business in Medford, he can even brand your whole life as a masquerade and tell them all who you really are and send you back to prison. Jack Foley, my old classmate, and I'm not mistaken. I've been very careful, Jack. My name is Wilson, Arthur Wilson. Sure, and mine's Jameson. Now it is. Used to be Sanders. Remember me? Three cells down from you. Same section, number 34192. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I've lived in Medford, Oregon for, for a quarter of a century. I never heard of you. Oh, come now, Foley. Put on your thinking cap. I've told you my name is Wilson, and I never saw you before. My, what a contrast in memory. Boy, I recognized you instantly. But it's understandable. I was a very young man, and you only knew me a short time. You um, left us rather suddenly, Jack. Stop calling me that. Sorry, sir. That better? <laughs> you know, I ought to call you Lucky. Lucky Jack Foley. Now, Arthur Wilson. Successful businessman, his daughter about to marry into one of the best families in the state. What are you after? Huh? Your memory's getting better, isn't it? What is it? What are you after? Is this some sort of blackmail pitch you're giving me? Now, you know, that's an interesting thought. It might be, if I were the man you think I am. The man I know you are. How long have you worked here, Jameson? Or Sanders, if you prefer? Six months or so. You must be out of your mind. Suppose I happen to be Jack Foley. Do you think for one minute that Mrs. Franklin or anyone else would take your word for it? No, sir. Certainly not. Well, then what are you driving at? Why all these ridiculous suggestions, Jameson? Sir, I have what is known in the trades as a black on white. Surely you remember Professor Slips Dolan, Dean of Forgery. He was in another section, but in the uh, apartment just below. I'm getting tired of this, Jameson. Great man, Professor Dolan. To the professor, any written document was a black on white. I, um, have such a document. Regarding Foley? Regarding you, sir. 
Yes. The light's very good out here. I'll show it to you. Just remember, the light's also too good for you to start anything. You seem to think of everything. Well, take a look at this and you'll really think so, sir. Yeah. The letterhead will convince you, I think. Look at it. Bureau of Identification, Washington, D.C. Department of Fingerprints. The Bureau of Identification sent my fingerprints to you? Oh, no, sir. It was the other way around. I sent your fingerprints to them. But uh, well, it's quite simple. My training, you know. I'm sure that as a hardware merchant, you were grateful, shall I say, to our alma mater for your work in the machine shop. I've used my training in photography to advantage many times. Taking fingerprints is a very simple process. Now hold on, Jameson. Where did you get my fingerprints? Oh, they're all over the house, sir. Naturally, as a servant anxious to please, I go all over the house. I picked up your prints the first night you were here. Water glass, wine glass, knife, fork. Then I sent the photographs off to Washington. It's incredible. But true, huh? The um, answer here arrived this morning. The prints of Jack Foley, escaped convict, and Mr. Arthur Wilson, hardware merchant, are exactly the same. Amazing coincidence, don't you think? What are you going to do? It's a question of what you're going to do, Jack. For me. Call me Wilson. Arthur Wilson. Gladly, Mr. Wilson. You'll cooperate, then? My daughter is getting married in four days. What is it you want? Oh, I'm very common as a blackmailer. I want money. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand dollars? You might as well ask for a million. I haven't had more than two or three thousand dollars in the past two years. Oh, come now. A prosperous hardware merchant? I don't even own the store, Jameson. Most of the stock is on consignment. You'll have to sell things much faster than you ever did, won't you, old chap? I can't raise that much money, Jameson. Now, I'm the one who's getting tired. You'll raise it fully every dime, no more, no less, and I want it by Tuesday at four o'clock. Two days? That's impossible. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to the police. Go right ahead. And I'll go to Mrs. Franklin with this letter. That'll wreck both our futures. But then I, uh, I haven't got my daughter's happiness to worry about. Tuesday at four, sir? Uh, I've got to have a chance to think, at least. Certainly, sir. As I suggested, put on your thinking cap. Good evening. Pleasant chat. Very pleasant chat. <laughs> There it is, Arthur, a demand that places your future and your daughter's happiness squarely on the block. It's all over if you don't meet Jameson's request for the money. And you haven't the slightest idea where you're going to get it, even part of it. But you have to try. The next morning from a booth in a neighborhood drugstore, you put through a call to Walter Reynolds, president of the Medford Grain Exchange Bank. I have your party, sir. Go ahead. Hello. Hello, Walter. This is Arthur Wilson. Oh, yes, Arthur. What can I do for you? Oh, something's come up. I, uh, well, I, I can't go into details over the phone, but uh, I've got to raise some money. Certainly, Arthur. It's an unusual amount, I'm but sure when I... I'm sure we can take care of it, Arthur. We'll be glad to credit your account with a couple of thousand. Well, it's, it's more than that. I, I need 20,000, Walter. 20,000? Why, you know we couldn't handle that, Arthur. I know it's a great deal, and I, well, I figured that banking with you for over 20 years meant something. It does, Arthur. Of course it does. That's why I just agreed to a couple of thousand, but 20, I, I can go only so far. Look, Arthur, if it'll do any good, I'll add my personal endorsement and make it 5,000. Five, 5,000? Five Is that better? I'll wire it to you down there in care of the Interstate Trust and Savings. 5,000. All right, then. Thanks, Walter. Thanks a lot. It doesn't mean much, does it? Added to your checking account and the few traveler's checks you're carrying, it's still a total of only $6,500. Jameson said $20,000. And you know that's his price for delivering you the letter from the Bureau of Identification that will bring your past to light. You put through another call to your closest friend, Ward Weston, only to discover that he's away on business and can't be reached. It's $6,500 or nothing, isn't it? And the next morning, returning from the Interstate Trust Bank, you tell yourself that you're going to get that letter. Later, you're nervous and trembling as you face Jameson well, in the library. 
You brought the money, have you? Look, Jameson, give me a break, will you? If you only realize... Here's the money, Foley, or I'll start talking. You, you can't. You can't do that. Oh, can't I? I don't care for myself, but it, it's Sally, her, her happiness. You can't do this, Jameson. It, it would ruin everything for her. I understand, Foley. I really wouldn't want that to happen. And it won't, as long as you hand over 20000 Well? I, I wasn't able to get it. You weren't able to... All right. How much did you get? Sixty-five hundred. Sixty-five hundred? Well, that's absurd, Foley. Not even half what I asked. Keep your voice down and stop calling me Foley. Oh, I should have told you we're practically alone. Mrs. Franklin went downtown. Stephen's out with your daughter. You're not going to destroy their happiness, Jameson. I want that letter. Now, don't get impulsive. I'm not fool enough to get careless, you see. A gun? What's that for? Protection. I know all about you. Your temper, your sudden way of doing things. It put you in jail, got you out. I don't want anything to... Sudden, huh? That gives me an idea. All right, my old classmate. Oh, drop it. Drop the let gun. Go. Let go my arm. Drop don't it. Break my arm. Well, Arthur, after all these years, you've done it again, haven't you? You stand over him, the rage slipping away into fear. You didn't try to kill Jameson, but you could never prove it if you were found here. You shake your head, trying to clear your sentence. The letter. You must get that letter. You stoop down, rummage through his pockets, and then turn to start out of the room. That's when you realize what Jameson meant when he said you were practically alone. There's a frightened girl standing there, Hilda the maid, her eyes wide, moving back and forth from you to the silent figure on the floor. You killed him. You shot Mrs. Jameson. No, Hilda. It was an accident. You've got to believe me. I saw it from the hall with my own eyes. It was self-defense. I had to do it, Hilda. You've got to tell them that. Oh, the door. Someone's at the door. Stall them, Hilda. Try to send them away. I've got to have time to think this I out. I saw your killing with my own eyes. I did. I'd like to see Mr. Jamison, please. I am from police headquarters. He, he's in there. Mr. Jamison? He's Mr. Wilson. That's Mr. Jameson on the floor. I, he's dead? Yes. Mr. Wilson there just killed him. I saw it with my own eyes, I did. Well, what do you know? I come to pick up a blackmailer and catch a killer right in the act. He stole a letter from Mr. Jameson's inside pocket. I saw him when he'd done it. With my own eyes. Let's have it, Wilson. Ah, Bureau of Identification, Washington, D.C. This letter must have meant a lot to you, Wilson. Come on, let's go. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, two points it'll pay every driver to remember if you want to be sure of the tops in quality when you buy gasoline. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. Yes, it's a fact. Mileage is the best yardstick of gasoline quality. After all, there's only one way any gasoline can give you quicker starting, faster pickup, and smoother power. That's by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you see proof of it on your speedometer in mileage, the very thing Signal gasoline is famous for. That's why we're so proud of Signal's good mileage, which has made Signal gasoline known from Canada to Mexico as the go-farther gasoline. And it's why we say, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. Now back to the whistler. <laughs> Well, it's all over, isn't it, Arthur? Your long years of living a double life. The end of the masquerade is Arthur Wilson, the name you took up some 25 years ago when under your real name, Jack Foley, you escaped from prison. And now, in a sudden moment of blind rage, you tried to disarm the butler, Jameson, who had known you in prison, the man who was blackmailing you, threatening to expose your almost forgotten past. And the struggle for the gun had ended with an explosion. And death. 
After a sleepless night in your cell, you're taken to the office of District Attorney Grant. Your one thought is for Sally. Yes, your daughter's approaching marriage means more to you than any punishment which the District Attorney might have in mind for you. As he faces you across the table, you barely understand his words. You're thinking only of protecting Sally and her future happiness. I sympathize with you, Mr. Wilson. Blackmail's a dirty business. But you should have let us handle it. The minute Jameson or Sanders wrote that letter to the FBI, it was all over for him. For him? That's right. Those boys down there never overlook a bet. Anytime they get a suspicious communication, they look into it. In this case, they naturally examined Sanders' note for fingerprints. His prints were in a dozen different spots. Sanders' prints? Sure. On both the letter and the envelope he mailed it in. From there on, it was a cinch. We've been looking for Sanders for a long time. When the Bureau tipped us off that the butler Jameson was Sanders, I sent one of my boys out to pick him up. If you waited a few minutes, he'd been out of your hair. You should have come straight to us, Wilson. I can see that now. Mr. Grant... Could you keep this out of the papers? Keep my name covered for a couple of days until after my daughter's wedding. Then I'll play any hand you deal. Your daughter's wedding? Yes. You see, she's being married. Being married? Oh, yes. I guess you haven't seen the morning papers. Your daughter eloped to Las Vegas, Nevada with young Franklin yesterday afternoon. Yesterday afternoon? Yeah. Somewhere around three o'clock, about an hour before you killed the butler. Seems the kids didn't want all the folder all of a big wedding and just took things into their own hands. Married. That's wonderful. Wait, does Mrs. Franklin know about me, my, my past? Oh, yes. She's retained her personal attorney to represent you. She's sure it was an accident. And Sally and Stephen, she's satisfied? She's quite happy. Thinks your daughter's a great girl. Too bad you've always been so impulsive, Wilson. You'd have been a lot better off if you'd have come to us right away. Even if it meant finishing your jail sentence. I know. But I just had to have that letter to Jameson from the Bureau of Identification. My daughter's happiness... You didn't read that letter, did you? No, your man took it before I had a chance. Take a look at it. Dear Mr. Jameson, regarding the fingerprint photos accompanying your inquiry as to the further identity of one Arthur Wilson... Please be advised that information of this kind is available only to duly authorized agencies for the enforcement of the law. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Ed Begley and Tom Collins. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Edward Bloodworth, and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I'm the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, 
I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Whistler will continue showing in your local theater. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Lady on a Yacht. A beautiful woman rapidly losing money at the gaming tables attracts attention in any part of the world. Anna Gerta Infante rose from the table at the resort of San Brisano in Argentina and left the room with a tall, dark Spaniard. All eyes were upon it. You wish to speak to me, Carlos? Yes. Yes, little sister. I am not your sister, Carlos. You are my sister-in-law, the widow of my dead brother. It is the same. As the head of the family, I must take care of you. You must not be careless, Gerta. Do not forget there are places in Europe where you are badly wanted, where you would face certain imprisonment and possible execution. I took care of myself before I married your brother, before I came to Argentina. I can do the same now. Now you are a member of our family. As the oldest son, I have the authority to demand that you come home with me before you lose the, the little fortune that my dead brother left to you. It is too late for that. It's gone. It's gone? All of it? Every peso. Then I am too late. Well, you must not worry. I'm not worried, Carlos. I have lost money, yes. But I have been playing for bigger stakes. I do not understand you, Gert. I have never understood you. It is the rich American. You mean Senor Philip Collins? Yes. For weeks I have been gambling. So has he. While losing at a table, I attracted his attention. He has fallen in love with me. And I with him. A North Americano. I wonder, does he know? That I am the widow of your brother, of course. But before that, if... Before that, before you came to Argentina. No, but there will be plenty of time to tell him. I am marrying him tomorrow morning and sailing from Argentina aboard his yacht. Your gamble paid off, didn't it, Goethe? You realize just how well when the big yacht set sail. It's been a long time since you've enjoyed such luxury, hasn't it? You're deeply concerned, however, when your new husband insists on a cruise through the Mediterranean before going to the United States. You have a strong fear of many European authorities. Yes, you are one of those listed for questioning regarding certain wartime activities. You never want to see Europe again, do you? Or have anyone in Europe see you? For there are many who hate you and would like nothing better than to turn you in. If any of them saw you, it could mean death or life imprisonment to you, couldn't it, Goethe? You persuade Philip to agree that you will never leave the yacht. But when you reach the southern coast of Italy, he insists that you go ashore with him to a small island where you visit a rather deserted outdoor cafe overlooking the water. What do you think of the view, Gerda? Oh, it's lovely, Philip. Perfectly lovely. Mm -hmm. You are happy, aren't you? Very happy. Let's sit here, shall we? <clears throat> oh, it is a nice, peaceful spot, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That artist making sketches and trying to sell the paintings. No, no, look over there. Oh, Yes. <laughs> The quiet type with that beard and beret. I'm going to call him over. Uh, how do you say artist in Italian? Pittore, I believe. Uh, Pittore. Si, senor. Will you come over here? At your service, senor. You wish to make a sketch of the lady? Yes, but first let's have a look at your paintings. Of course. Please step over here. I am honored, senor. Yeah, these are very pretty, aren't they, Goethe? Yes, Philip, they're very good. Hmm. Which one would you like to have? Oh, 
That landscape, I believe. All right, then that landscape it is. Uh, how much is it? Oh, you name the price, senor. Oh, well, uh, never mind. We'll talk about that later. Uh, what's your name? Conrad Marlin. Marlin, how about doing a sketch of Mrs. Collins? Oh, with the greatest of pleasure, if Madame would remove her dark glasses. I'm sorry. I'm afraid the sun is too bright. Oh, but Gerda, he can't sketch I'm you with so you. I'm so sorry, uh, Philip. Oh, well, never mind. Now, wait a minute. I have an idea. Marlin. Yes? I'll have you brought out to our yacht tomorrow. You can sketch Mrs. Collins there, where she'll be more comfortable. <laughs> Why don't you sketch Mrs. Collins uh, here, Marlon, on the deck standing against the rail? Oh, that will be very nice, Mr. Collins. What do you think about it, Gerda? Whatever you wish, Philip. Good. Well, I'll leave you two alone. Come down and have a drink with me when you're through, Marlon. Thank you, Mr. Collins. You are most kind. Now, Mrs. Collins, if you will raise your head a bit. Like this? Perfect. Lovely subject. <clears throat> I uh, am aware, of course, that Madame is not an American. I see. My accent. I am from Argentina. I know that. You went there early in 1945 from Germany, Frau von Reckenwitz. Why do you call me that? That is the way I addressed you when I painted the wedding portrait of you and your illustrious husband, General von Reckenwitz. I don't understand. I have changed a great deal, have I not? This beard. I am Kruger. Kruger? At one time, the most popular portrait artist in Central Europe. Unfortunately, those days are gone. Now one must disguise oneself, carry papers under a false name, beg from tourists. No one can understand my position better than Madame. Who is also concealing her connection with the past? What do you mean? What makes you think that? Americans do not marry the widows of our famous leaders, like General von Reckenwitz, if they know. You think not? No, not even when they are as lovely as Madame. I need money badly. Say that you like the sketch so well that you want to engage me to paint your portrait. Mr. Collins will agree, I'm sure. But why is the portrait necessary? I have money. I would be glad to help an old friend. No, no, no. You can help me best through the portrait. Why? Take it to America with you. Hang it in your fine living room. Mr. Collins will show it to his friends. Tell them that Conrad Marlin painted it. There will be commissions awaiting me when I arrive there myself. You... You plan to go to America? Oh... Yes, with the rich husband of my good friend, Goethe von Reckenwitz Collins, to help me. Why not? Well, Goethe, it's infuriating, isn't it? You're anxious to get to America, and now the yacht remains anchored off this Mediterranean island while the artist Kruger, now known as Conrad Marlin, paints your portrait. But you know one thing. You'll see that the portrait never reaches the United States, where it could be used to further his interests. The sittings for the portrait seem endless, and you're constantly on your guard, concealing your dislike for the artist and making a pretense of friendliness. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm afraid I moved. Oh, that's quite all right, Mrs. Collins. Turn your head a bit more to the left, please. Like this? Ah, yeah, that's fine. I notice Mr. Collins is not here today. He went to the mainland to see someone at the American consulate. Oh, then you plan to leave here soon? Oh, yes. As soon as the portrait is finished and my papers arrive from Argentina. Oh, about the portrait. It will be finished tomorrow. Tomorrow? Really? I can hardly wait to see it. I hope that Mr. Collins will like it. I'm sure that he will. This painting, your portrait, has all been very fortunate for me. I have enjoyed our chats together. It is good to be able to talk to someone who understands. He's been good for me, too. But uh, we must both remember I am married to an American now. Ah, there you are. Gerda, 
I brought a gentleman from the American consulate back to meet you. His name is Beardsley, an old friend of mine. He's staying for dinner. Oh, well, that will be nice. Uh, how much longer is that going to take, Marlon? Oh, the setting is nearly finished for today, Mr. Collins. Good. Well, hurry along. And when you're through here, Goethe, you'll find Beardsley and me in the lounge. <laughs> That was a narrow escape, wasn't it, Goethe? Suppose Philip had returned a few minutes earlier and overheard Mullen's remark. It's very dangerous having him around, isn't it? But after the final sitting tomorrow, there will be no reason for him to return to the yacht. Later, when you go into the lounge, you see Philip and his guest at the far end near the bar. They don't notice you as they're looking at the landscape you bought for Mullen the first day at the island. Oh, very nice. Where'd you get this, Collins? From an itinerant artist on the island. You like it, then, huh? Oh, yes, very much. Happen to know the name of the artist? Yes, it's Marlin, Conrad Marlin. Marlin. Uh-huh. Oh, no, I never heard of him. Got a lot of talent. Yes, I should say so. He seems to be down and out. Well, that frequently happens in this part of the world. You know, I've got an idea. Mm-hmm. Why? Why don't I take him to America with us? He could make a good living there. Could that be fixed up? You mean about his papers? Yes. Oh, perhaps. If he's already applied for a visa, there wouldn't be any wait. All you would have to do would be to uh, sign as his sponsor. Good, good. It's a deal. <laughs> All right. Bring him over to the consulate to see me in the next day or so. I will. Well, this calls for a drink, Beardsley. Ah. Uh, Scotch? Uh, yes, thank you. Good. And how about one for me? Huh? Oh, Gerda, there you are. This is Gordon Beardsley, dear. My wife, Beardsley. How do you do, Mr. Beardsley? Mr. Collins. Oh, will you have, dear, the usual? Yes, please. Beardsley has been admiring Marlin's landscape. Oh? You like it, Mr. Beardsley? Oh, very much indeed. I'll tell you what. We'll get you one of his pictures as a present. Goethe, you see about it tomorrow when Marlin comes out to the yacht to work on your portrait. He's painting your portrait, Mrs. Collins, huh? Yes, he is. Uh, how is it coming along? Oh, very well, I believe. Now, that's interesting. You know, there aren't too many men who do both portrait and landscape equally well. Is that right? Yes. There was one man in Berlin, though, named uh, uh, Kruger. He did good landscape and also painted all the top political figures. What became of the artist? Hasn't been heard of since the war. Disappeared oh, like yeah. so many others. He was wanted by the authorities. Oh, he's probably dead now. Or in South America. A lot of those political refugees went there, you know. Is that so? Oh, those people are scattered to the four corners of the globe. Mm. Doesn't matter much to us where they are until they try to enter the United States. Then, of course, it's different. That's pretty closely watched, isn't it, Bisley? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. yes. Of course, there are certain cases where we're virtually helpless, where certain beautiful women are concerned, for uh-huh. example. Some of these women were close friends or were married to key figures of the Nazi regime, and after the war, these women simply... Uh, Attached themselves to other important men. And in that way, they entered the United States, huh? At times, yes. Well, I don't like that. I don't like it at all. No, nor do I. (laughs) But before turning down an application for a visa, I have to find some proof, you know, something concrete. And in the cases of many of these women, especially when they've been away from Europe for some years or married prominent citizens of other countries, such proof is difficult to get. That's interesting, isn't it, Goethe? You're confident that if you're not recognized as the widow of the infamous General von Reckenwitz, the woman who was his willing co-worker in his ruthless and cruel atrocities against countless helpless war victims, you have little to worry over. And once your husband's yacht set sail for America, there won't be anyone who could recognize you, will there, Goethe? Except the artist Kruger, now known as Mollen. You decide you can't let Marlon join you and your husband on the yacht. No. You must get him out of the way on some pretext while Philip is in Rome. But the next morning, as Philip prepares to leave, he suggests you go with him. Philip, darling, that's impossible. Marlon will come this afternoon to finish the portrait. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, tell him I want to see him as soon as I get back. Of course, dear. And, and don't forget about that painting for Beardsley. Get something really interesting and have it sent over to the mainland with a nice personal note. Now, Mrs. Collins, you may look. Your portrait is finished. I am very proud of it. It is nice. 
Very nice. You are pleased? I'm sure it will look very well somewhere in our house. You will see it there when you come to America. Oh, you have spoken to Mr. Collins about that. Yes, and he plans to bring you into the country. He will start arrangements as soon as he gets home. Oh, madame, I, I cannot express my gratitude. Well, it's nothing. But uh, I have a suggestion to make. Hmm? Perhaps you should leave Italy by another port. Another port? I, I do not understand. I believe Mr. Beardsley from the American consulate suspects who you are from something he said last night. That would make things bad for you, wouldn't it? Worse than you know. If it is learned that I am Kruger, my, my life will be in danger. I would never live to reach the United States. I must go somewhere else, to, to Genoa, perhaps. I'm sure I will be able to get new papers there, but, but that will take money. I'll help you. I have a considerable amount with me. Here, in my bag. Here, take it all. Oh, there, there is no way to thank you, Mrs. Collins. It is very little to do for an old friend. And I have nothing to offer you in return, except here. Here is a painting. I brought it for you today as a gift to celebrate the completion of the portrait. Thank you. Oh, it's lovely. It is the famous Blue Grotto at Capri. The Blue Grotto? Yes, has great sentimental value for me. I, I would not give it to anyone but you, and I want you to keep it. It will make me very happy. And now, if you will excuse me, I must hurry. Of course. Goodbye, madame. You are a very gracious lady. Please be assured of my undying devotion. <laughs> It was simple, wasn't it, Gerda? With Marlin out of the way, there's nothing to prevent your sailing as soon as you get your visa. And you feel sure that later, after you get to America, you can tell Philip of your wartime marriage to General von Reckenwitz. Convince him it was the impulsive act of a young, naive girl that you didn't know what you were doing. Yes, things are working out well. And although you forget to purchase a painting for Mr. Beardsley, as your husband requested, the painting of the Blue Grotto, which Marlin gave you, will serve equally well as a gift for Mr. Beardsley. By the time Philip returns from Rome, you're in excellent spirits. Philip, I'm so glad you're back. Did you have a nice trip? Yes, dear, and a profitable one, but over a big deal. And I've got good news for you, too. Yes? I stopped at the consulate and saw Beardsley. Your papers have arrived from Argentina, and everything's fine. Your visa will be ready any day. Oh, that is good news. Oh, by the way, that picture you sent Beardsley made a big hit with him. Really? Yes, he said to compliment you on your good taste. How nice. Bisley says it's the Blue Grotto at Capri. He's already got it framed and hanging in his office. You know, he's very enthusiastic about Mullen. Oh, did you tell Mullen I wanted to see him today? Yes, but Philip, he's left the island. He, he's left? What for? I don't know. Oh, but good heavens, why would he leave? The man hasn't a cent and he knows I'm going to do big things for him. I don't understand it either. I begged him to stay. You have no idea where he went? No, Philip. I hope you don't blame me. I did everything I blame could. Oh, no, no, of course not, dear, but he can't have got very far. I'll have the police pick him up and bring him back. Bring him back? Oh, sure. He'll come back fast enough when he knows what I want him for. I'll have his description wired to every corner of Italy. But is it really worth the trouble? It is to me. The man's a great artist. I want Mullen in America. He goes to America with us no matter how long it takes to find him. You mean we won't sail without him? Goethe, this yacht doesn't budge from this spot without Mullen aboard. It's infuriating and frightening, too, isn't it, Goethe? If Mullen is brought back, he'll know that you lied to him, and instead of a friend, he'll be a dangerous enemy. There's nothing you can do but wait and hope that the Italian police can't locate. The next days pass slowly. You feel trapped in this corner of the Mediterranean. Pace up and down the deck of the yacht. The bright sun is annoying and you begin to hate the Italian coastline. Then one day, Philip gets a call to come to the mainland at once. When he returns, his face is grim. Philip, what's wrong? Has anything happened? Yes, plenty Malin, he's been found. Where? In Genoa. I'll give the Italian police credit. It didn't take them long. And uh, he's coming back? No. He's not coming back. 
Why not? He's dead. Dead? Yes. Killed in a gun battle with the police. He fired first. But why, Philip? Well, it's a long, unpleasant story, and I hate to upset you with it. Gerda, his name wasn't Malin at all, but Kruger or something like that. Anyway, he was wanted for looting some art galleries during the war, had the stolen paintings in his possession, and so when the police went to pick him up, he thought his identity was discovered and they were going to arrest him, and, well, the gun battle followed. How horrible. Yes, yes, it is pretty gruesome. But you can put the whole thing right out of your mind. We're getting out of here. You mean we're going to save? Just as quick as we can. Your visa's ready. We'll run over to the mainland and pick it up tomorrow, then get underway the following morning. You're certain now that everything has turned out very well, aren't you, Gerta? Yes, at last you're free to leave for the United States with your wealthy American husband. There's a lot of activity aboard the yacht the next morning as preparations for sailing are made. And you're in a state of excitement when you go over to the mainland with Philip to get your visa from the American consulate. You're quickly shown into Mr. Beardsley's private office, where he greets you warmly and tells you your visa will be ready in a moment. Oh, I hate to see you leave, Collins. I'll miss you and Mrs. Collins. Personally, I can hardly wait to get out of here. That Mullen business was pretty embarrassing to me. I made a fool out of myself. No, you didn't, Philip. Well, I... How could you possibly know that Marlon was a thief? It's quite sad in a way, too. Marlon had a great talent. That blue grotto Mrs. Collins gave me was one of the nicest pictures I've ever owned. Certainly, where is that blue grotto? It was hanging here in your office yesterday. Oh, it's in the next room. An art restorer is working on it. An art restorer? What for? Well, he's taking the blue grotto off. There's a painting underneath. How do you know? I had it x-rayed. You see, Kruger had painted new scenes over several of the paintings he had stolen. Stolen masterpieces are often hidden that way. Yes, but that makes no sense. If that picture had another valuable painting underneath, Kruger wouldn't have sold it to Mrs. Collins. He did sell you the picture, didn't he, Gerda? Of course, Philip. Well, at any rate, I called in a restorer, and he's been working on it all morning. Well, I'd like to see that. Do you mind if we look? No, of course not. He's working right in here. Oh, won't you come along, Mrs. Collins? Of course. Well, sir, how is the restoration coming? Oh, I have just finished, senor. Really? That was quick work. The top picture was easily removed. The underpainting was heavily varnished with the idea of keeping it intact. And the underpainting, do you think it's a masterpiece? Oh, no, I don't think so, senor. It is a portrait, a wedding portrait. Oh, what do you know about that? Let's have a look at it. Very good, senor. I will place it here where you can see it clearly in the light. It is a picture of the notorious Nazi general von Reckenwitz and his beautiful wife, Goethe. The Whistler. Listen next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe present The Whistler. facilities of the United States Armed The Signal Oil Program The Whistler That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program The Whistler And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. 
Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is top, too. Tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Murder in haste. Albert Taylor was two people. To the Cafe Society crowd in Miami, he was the charming young husband of a silver fortune from Denver. To his wife, Helen, aged 45, amply mature, the silver fortune, he was something else again, an unpleasant little boy whose unpleasantness had a tendency to make the large fortune into a smaller one. This made for friction, of course. After three years of marriage, Helen was heartily sick of both Elbert. And Elbert, too, had reached the saturation point. As a matter of fact, the unpleasant little boy was on the verge of a tantrum. Elbert, is that you? Yeah. Elbert, I'm awfully upset. Oh, what now? My bracelet, the diamond and emerald one. I put it in a drawer of my vanity last night after the party. Well, what about it? It's gone. I've questioned the servant. Did you call the police? No. Good. What do you mean? I told you I wanted to buy some things, Helen. I see. And what did you do with it? I sold it, of course. You sold it? Well, that's very interesting. It didn't occur to you, of course, to consult me. It occurred to me. I rejected the idea after due deliberation. Why, you and I don't want a to... scene about it, Helen. I took it, I sold it, period. I'm through consulting you about anything, you understand? There'll be no more sitting up and begging. That's what you want, isn't it? Come one, come all. Watch Albert, the trained terrier. Eats, sleeps, walks, talks, thinks like a human being. That's enough, Elbert. You bet it's enough. I'm sick of it. I'm through with being your favorite charity. You don't know how right you are. What do you think you're doing? I'm going to call the police and tell them you've stolen my bracelet. Give me that phone. <clears throat> now. I told you what I'm going to do, Elbert. Let go of you me. You want to watch me jump, don't you? You want to crack the whip and watch me jump. Elbert, don't. Please, Well, Elbert. I'm through with that, Helen. I'm through with you and your whip cracking all through. Helen? Helen, I'm sorry. I... Helen? Why don't you do something, Elbert? Why don't you go over there to the hearth and pick her up? Or perhaps you're not as dazed as you look standing there in the middle of the room. Maybe even now you know she won't ever get up because she struck her temple on the andiron when you hurled her across the room. Yes, Elbert. She's lying there so very still because she's dead. <laughs> With the prologue of Murder in Haste, the Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. You know, friends, while watching some Christmas shoppers this morning, the thought occurred to me, if people would only choose their gasoline as carefully as they pick out Christmas gifts, a lot more drivers would be using Signal gasoline. And for good reason. If you've traveled the West much at all, you already know that from Canada to Mexico, Signal is famous as the go-farther gasoline. But even more important to you is the quality in Signal gasoline, of which that mileage is your best proof. For after all, in order for a gasoline to give you better mileage, it has to make your engine run more efficiently. And when your engine runs more efficiently, you naturally enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, smoother knock-free power the kind of superior performance you expect of a superior quality gasoline. That's why we say, to be sure of the tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler.
Yes, Delbert. There'll be no more ugly squabbles, no more jumping through hoops for Helen, because the last argument was final, wasn't it? So final that your wife, Helen, lies dead in front of the heart. A minute later, you've decided on the only course of action possible. You leave her in her bedroom and lock the door. The servants in their separate quarters are used to your arguments and probably have paid no attention. Two hours and 20 minutes later, you're standing on the observation platform of the Limited Express bound for Jacksonville and points north. Nice night. Huh? Oh, I didn't hear you come out. It's all right. I say, it's a nice night. Yeah. Saw you running for the train when we were pulling out. Just made it, didn't you? Yeah, yeah kind of close. Hmm. Been in Miami long? Uh, no. I've been fishing off the Keys. Just a week or so. I see. Uh, my name's Ricketts. Ah, oh, glad to know you. I'm, uh, a Brown. Richard Brown. Mm-hmm. Going up to New York, Brown? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I guess I'll be getting inside, Ricketts. Good idea. And a breezy out here. I'll go with you. You knew it the minute he opened his mouth, didn't you, Elbert? Ricketts is a plain-clothed cop, and there can be only one reason why he's so interested in you. He's right behind you as you walk back through the train to your seat, and you're wondering if he'll sit beside you when you stop there. And then, when you're ten feet from your seat, it hits you. You realize why he's following you. Your luggage with your initials E.T. on it is in the baggage rack over the seat. And Ricketts is just waiting for you to stop there. You hold your breath and keep on going. Uh, Brown? Yeah? Isn't this your seat? Why, uh, no. I have a compartment up ahead. Oh, I see. Well, good night, Brown. Good night. There's only one place to go, the club car and the bar where you can sit for a minute and think. Yes? Make it a Manhattan dry. Dry Manhattan, yes, sir. Is this your magazine? Hmm? Oh, no. No, go right ahead. <clears throat> you going to New York? Yeah. Oh, it ought to be cold up there this time of the year. A lot of snow and all that, huh? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm as excited as a kid. I haven't seen snow for an age. Matter of fact, I haven't set foot in America for five years. Oh, it's great to be back. I get a kick out of just talking to an American again. Yeah. I was sitting in my compartment a few minutes ago you, uh, thinking that I... You, uh, got a compartment? Yeah, a couple of cars ahead. Uh, uh my name's Brown, Mr., uh... Jameson. Leslie Jameson. Jameson? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, you're not the, uh, the mystery writer. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid I am. Here you are, sir. Dry man. Oh, thanks. Well, here's to you, What's the matter? Uh, nothing. Say, uh, Jameson, why don't we go to your compartment? Be quieter there. We can have the drinks sent in. Why, of course. Well, that's a good idea. Yes, Albert. The compartment would be quieter and you'd feel a little more comfortable. Particularly since you noticed your friend, Mr. Rickett, stroll into the bar and sit down. Still hunting for the occupant of your seat, no doubt. Mr. Jameson finds his compartment uh, yeah, pleasanter, too. Was. A man can't stay forever in Buenos Aires and continue to write for the American public. He's got to keep in touch, don't you think so? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, of course. So, uh, you say you left Buenos Aires? Yeah, I'd planned to anyway, but I, I made it a little earlier on account of that nasty business with my assistant. Oh, I see. I'll probably go back in a year or so. Say, Brown, did you ever read anything of mine? Well, I can't say I've done much reading in the detective storyline. You have a serial running in one of the magazines right now, don't you? Yeah, Murder in Haste. <laughs> I don't suppose you've read it, huh? No. I'm sorry. If I'd known I was going to meet the author, I'd have boned up on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't apologize, Brown. Hey, how about a nightcap before we turn in, huh? Why, it's early, uh, Jameson. Surely you're not going to give up the ship so soon. Oh, I've got to confess. I'm a little bushed. Uh, uh, tell me more about your agent in New York. You were saying you, uh... You've never met him personally, huh? Oh, uh, oh, you mean Farrell. He's always a great agent. I've often wondered what he looks like. <laughs> Sometimes I think he must be a, a magician with a long beard. The way he pulls royalties out of a hat. I sold my leading character to a radio you've, series. Uh, you've never even been to New York? No, never. I, I'm probably the only man in the business who can say that. 
Well, Brown, it's close to midnight, and I Jameson, think... Jameson, uh, what about this cereal you're running? Uh, maybe you could bring me up to date on it and... Uh... Brown, I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Right now, I'm awfully tired. Oh, it's early yet, Jameson. Now, look here. I don't want to be rude, but I'll have to ask you... Hey, what's the matter? What's that? Hey, they're trying to stop. It sounds like something... Hey, off! Look out! Hey, Jameson! <laughs> An open switch, a signal down, and the southbound local is suddenly there on the same track without warning. It's over in a split second. Then you open your eyes, Albert. You're all right, miraculously safe in the tangled network of steel and splintered wood that used to be a Pullman car. And there's Leslie Jameson. He wasn't so lucky, Albert. There's nothing you can do for him now. The other end of the coach is in flames and they're moving towards you. If I can make it out this window. There. Here, let me help you. Give me your hand. That's it. Thanks. You all right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm a little dizzy. Scratched up, I guess. Yeah, I see you. Oh, it's you, Mr. Brown. Huh? Oh, Ricketts. Yeah, you're lucky. This car got it worst of all. Look at that fire. Yeah, just got out in time. Say, that fellow you were drinking with at the bar. Went to your compartment with you. Is he still in there? Huh? My compartment? I'm pretty sure he's Albert E. Taylor. Murdered his wife in Miami. Is he still there? Why, uh... Why, no. He, uh... He left a few minutes before the crash. Oh. Well, you better get on ahead, Mr. Brown. I gotta give him a hand here. Can you make it up to the crossing? Yeah, I guess so. Well, take it easy. There's a highway restaurant up there. Sure, sure. I'm okay. Thanks. Okay, Brown. Take it easy. Well, Albert, you stand there dazed for a minute, watching the fire move closer. Then you decide to take a chance. Crawl back to Leslie Jameson's body, take his wallet, his ring and watch. Exchange them for your ring and watch, engraved, To Albert with all my love, Helen. Then as the flames move close, you find his briefcase and bag and crawl out with him. Ten minutes later, you stagger into the highway restaurant at the grade crossing. Say, I, uh, I wonder if you can help me. I, uh... You hurt, mister? We got a doc in the back room. Come on. No, 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 to... no, I'm all right. I just want to get out of here. I thought I could, uh, hire a car or get a bus to New York. Uh, you were in the wreck, mister? Yes. Well, look, I, I'm the news correspondent here. Could you give me your name, please? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Leslie Jameson. Uh-huh, Leslie Jameson. Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you the fellow who writes those murder mysteries? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, if that ain't a coincidence, Frank. Yeah. Only last night you and me made that bet. Well, sure. Now we can settle it once and for all. Yeah, we was betting which one would turn out to be the murderer in that magazine serial you're running. Yeah, yeah well, it. that's very flattering. Say, I, I wonder if you could help me about the bus I made. Uh, uh, well, say, Mr. Jameson, could you give us an advance tip on the murder? Yeah, then I won't have to wait for the magazine to come out tomorrow to collect from this guy. Well, it says you. Who was it, Mr. Jameson? Who? Well, uh, I, I don't think it would be fair to reveal the... Uh... Give me a fast cup of coffee, will you? Yeah, sure. Crickets. Oh, hello. Pretty rough out there. Three cars gone. What are you guys standing around here for? Have you been out there and looked at it? Well, I gotta stand by this counter. Yeah, and I'm a reporter, pal. This is where they're bringing them. This is where I get my stories. Yeah, and I was getting a swell right, story. Skip it. You. How do you feel, Brown? Brown? Well, that's Leslie Jameson, the writer. Huh? I thought your name was Brown. Well, uh, of course I, uh, <laughs> you know how it is. Uh, here's your coffee. Thanks. No, Mr. Brown, I don't know how it is. But how is it? Leslie Jameson, famous mystery story writer, <laughs> traveling incognito, narrowly escaped death when the crash... You see, fire. Ricketts, I, uh, I didn't want people to know. Oh, I get it. We've been reading Mr. Jameson's serial, Murder in Haste. I had a little bet with Frank here on who the murderer was. Well, I can tell you that. I read the last installment last night. Yeah? yeah sure. Got it at a newsstand in Miami. Oh, well, we ain't got it here yet. Well, oh, come on, Mr. Jameson, who done it? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't want to spoil the story for you. you Gotta finish it. Uh huh. Afraid we won't buy another copy of that magazine, huh? Yeah. Uh, come on, Jameson. Well, you see, gentlemen, it's a, uh, it's a matter of ethics. A writer what can't. What do you mean ethics? I know how it ends. Well, sure, Jameson. Sure. I can tell the boys I got it straight from the author's mouth. Oh, come on. What goal? Well, I don't want to review. I uh, got you a car, Lieutenant. Oh, good. Be right with you. Say, you guys know anyone who wants to go up to New York? I got some unfinished business up there. I'm hiring a car. I'd like to get somebody sharing the driving. Well, Jameson here. Well, sure. You said you were going to New York, didn't you, Jameson? Well, as a matter of fact, the bus... Well, come on. Give me a hand in the driving, huh? Well, all right. Good. 
But first, give the boys a break. Tell them who the murderer was. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's against my principles. Well, it's your business. Come on. It was the old lady who did it. I knew it. Pay me. You got a hotel space in New York, Jameson? Well, not yet. I, uh, I thought I'd arrange when I arrived. Oh, you haven't been around much lately, I see. Probably isn't a room to be at. Oh, is it that bad? Worse. Well, I think I might be able to fix it up for you at the Midtown. I know the manager there. Oh, I, I couldn't possibly. Uh, forget it, Jameson. Glad to help you out. Can you fix him up, Walter? I think so. Just signed the register, Mr. Uh... Jameson. Leslie Jameson, the writer? Well, why didn't you say so? Look, uh, I, I don't want to put you Nonsense. on. Nonsense. I... We're honored, Mr. Jameson. I'm a mystery fan myself. I want to tell you that murder in haste had me fooled right up to the last page. Uh, Peters. Yeah, boy. Uh, this is Mr. Leslie Jameson. Get the boys over. We want to take a few pictures. Right. Uh, pictures? Now, wait a minute. I don't Nothing want any pictures. Nothing to it, Mr. Jameson. Just a couple of boys from the papers. I know you're tired, but it won't take long. And, uh, oh, Peters. Yeah? I have some flowers sent up to Mr. Jameson's room. We'll have the pictures taken there. Uh, Peters is our press agent, Mr. Jameson. He'll take care of you. Certainly will, Mr. Jameson. Right this way. Now, look here, Peters. Huh? You look like a reasonable man. I never have my picture taken, and I don't intend to stand for it now. Ah, uh, you don't know New York newspaper photographers, Mr. Jameson. It's much easier if you give in. What'll happen if I refuse? You'll find out. And you did find out, didn't you, Elder? You were helpless. There was nothing you could do. They came, they saw, they took pictures. And all you could do was rage and try to keep your face covered. And that only made a better story for them. They were delighted, Elbert. The next day, there are pictures of you in the tabloids hiding your face under the caption, Leslie Jameson, mystery author, stages publicity scene in the room at Midtown Hotel. The second page of the same paper carries news that you, Elbert Taylor, wanted for the murder of your wife in Miami, perished in the train wreck. But you're all mixed up now, aren't you, Elbert? You almost wish Helen was with you again to make the decisions for you like she used to. And then suddenly there's nothing for you to do. The decision is all made. Yes? Mr. Jameson? Yes? Uh, Mrs. Jameson's on her way up. What? Your wife. I, I assumed it would be all right to tell her. Oh. Oh, yes. Mrs. Jameson. Hello, Leslie. What, what are you... Maybe I'd better come in. Well? Well, what? What are you going to do about it? You're an awfully simple sort, aren't you, Mr... Whatever your name is. I suppose I am. How did you expect to get away with it after all the publicity? Where is he? What have you done to him? Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Jameson. I can explain everything. Maybe you'd better. Your husband was killed in that train wreck in Florida. I, uh, I had reasons for wanting to disappear, so I took his identity. I never meant to keep it up. If you'll just... Just what? Look, there's nothing we can do for your husband now. He was killed in the wreck. You believe that, don't you? I don't know. Look, I'm going to believe town. I... All I ask is that you forget you ever saw me. Oh, I see well, what are you going to do? Well, I could go to the police, of course. Oh, wait a minute. I I can make it worth your while Oh, stop to... simpering. Does anyone know you're here in New York? No. That's very fortunate. You see, Leslie and I didn't get along. As a matter of fact, we've been separated for some time. He said he was cutting me out of his will. With Leslie dead, I don't get anything at all. But with Leslie alive... Wait a minute... You wouldn't... Why not? He could retire right now and live on his royalties without doing another lick. You mean you want me to... to keep this up? Yes. Don't be ridiculous. There are a dozen reasons why I can't. They'll discover it in a week. You have his identification. Yes, I know but... his signature. I can imitate it perfectly. I know his background like a book. <laughs> you may as well get used to it. Mr. Jameson. 
I tell you, I won't do it. It's... It's the most fantastic thing I've There's ever heard of. There's a Lieutenant Ricketts down in the lobby. He seemed quite interested in our relationship. If you like, of course, I could bring him up to date. All right, Mrs. Jameson. Oh, darling. Just call me Ruth. <laughs> Ruth. Ruth. Yes, what is it? I tell you, this can't go on. You're spending money like a child. $28,000 in three months besides the deposits I made to your account. Behind in the rent, the maid hasn't been paid. But look at these bills. Just look at them. I haven't got a penny. Are you all through? There's your quarterly royalty check due tomorrow. Well, that'll only pay part of the bills. It's not paying any of them, darling. That's going into my account. Oh, I see. And maybe you've got a fast way of getting out from under these bills? That's your worry, baby. Not mine. Well, what is it now? I'm afraid it's the same old thing, dear. I just can't seem to hold on to money. How much this time? Quite a bit, I'm afraid. I want $25,000, Albert. Twenty? What are you talking about? I have about? an obligation to meet. I need the money this afternoon before the banks close. And don't tell me it isn't there because the check covering movie rights to stolen murder was deposited yesterday. You know, you make very good sense. You'd better hurry down to the bank. It's after two. Ruth, be honest with me. How long do you intend to carry on with this? Why... Indefinitely, dear. I know when I have a good thing. There's no end? There is if you want one. There are the police. You can be decent about it, you know. There could have been plenty without bleeding me to death. I think I've been pretty fair with you. Six months now, no sleep. Pound a day and night. Can't oh, eat. This trying isn't to getting dodge us anywhere. my shadow. Getting nowhere. Afraid all the time. Dagger hanging over my Albert, head. Albert, what's happened to you? Get hold of yourself. No way out now, is there? Trapped. Run into a corner. No way to turn. Albert, what are you doing? Albert, get away from me! Main floor. Yeah. Just a minute, mister. I, I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry. You're, uh, Jameson, aren't you? Yes. In a hurry? I, uh... I'm on my way to the bank. It closes in a few minutes. Take your time, as always, tomorrow, you know. But, but I can't. I've your, got Your to... uh, wife's upstairs, isn't she? Uh, well... I saw her go up a few minutes ago. I'm Sergeant Lake, Jameson. I want to see her, and I'd like to have you along. Uh, after you. Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a message especially for you drivers who have new cars or expect to be getting one. Just any motor oil won't do, you know, for today's high-efficiency motors. No, sir. They need special protection against corrosion, wear, and carbon if they're to give you the long, trouble-free service you have a right to expect. That's why Signal has brought out a new and finer motor oil especially created to give modern motors this extra protection. Of course, Signal Premium has 100% pure paraffin base, but in addition, a total of five scientific new compounds have been added to Signal Premium motor oil. As a result, actual tests prove that this new type Signal oil keeps motors six times cleaner and reduces cylinder wear one-third. Get that. Motors actually stay six times cleaner and cylinder wear is reduced one-third with Signal Premium Motor Oil. So if you want to keep the performance of your car young, make your next oil change a change for the better. Switch to the new type Signal Oil that's your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now back to the Whistler. And that's how it ended, Albert. With the two of you, you and Sergeant Lake, standing over Ruth's body where you left it on the floor of your apartment upstairs. 
It's over now, and somehow you feel relieved. The hounding, the fear, the dagger hanging over your head. They're gone now. And you lean back in the chair in Sergeant Lake's office at police headquarters and tell them the whole thing. I couldn't take any more of it. I knew it'd go on for the rest of my life. Day after day. Year after year. I see. You, uh... You know, of course, she's not my wife. Yeah, that's why I was following her, and she knew it. Oh, and incidentally, that's why she hit you for that 25000 bucks this afternoon. It was the last big bite. What? There were plane tickets in her purse. She was on her way out. You mean it was the last time? That's right. But what I can't figure is why you let her shake you down in the first place. After the jam she was in in Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. Wait. She, she was the assistant. Of course she was your assistant down there. What's the matter, Jameson? A lapse of memory or something? Assistant. Yeah, yeah, he told me. I remember. On the train that night, just before the wreck. Tell me, Sergeant. Yeah? Down there in Buenos Aires. What was it she did? <laughs> you have lost your memory, Jameson. It was all over Argentina six months ago. That's why I've been following her. I was all ready to pick her up. She's wanted down there for murder. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Each Wednesday night at this same time, brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were David Ellis and Joan Banks. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, with story by Eleanor Beeson and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Next Wednesday, for a full hour of mystery over most of these stations, tune in a half hour earlier. Enjoy The Saint, as well as The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>